Thanks for joining us on This Week in Health IT Influence. My name is Bill Russell, former healthcare CIO for 16 Hospital System and creator of This Week in Health IT, a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Today, we are joined by Cletus Earl, the CIO for Penn State Health. Special thanks to our Influence show sponsors, Sirius Healthcare and Health Lyrics for choosing to invest in our mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. If you wanna be a part of our mission, you can become a show sponsor as well. The first step is to send an email to partner at thisweekinhealthit.com. Just a quick note before we get to our show, we launched a new podcast today in health IT. We look at one story every weekday morning and we break it down from a health IT perspective. You can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts at Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, you name it, we're out there. You can also go to todayinhealthit.com. And now on to today's show. Today, we are joined by Cletus Earl, the CIO for Penn State Health. Cletus, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. It's a pleasure being back. Man, I love the uh, Nittany Lions behind you. It looks it looks really awesome. Of course, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I know what a, what a big deal Penn State is to uh, to the people of Pennsylvania. So it's a pleasure being here. I'm I'm very proud to have the the lion on my as my background, and just being part of an organization that is has a reputation of excellence. So I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You got the dogs in the background. Are you working from home? Yeah, I'm working from home. So sorry about the background noise if you're hearing. Oh, no, we've, to... we've all gotten used to it. It's this, <laughs> this is just part of the world we live in these days. So yeah. if people hear the dogs in the back, they sound like significant dogs. What kind of dog? Bernadoodles. <laughs> so okay. so uh, they, we, we ended up getting two brothers, two siblings and part of the pandemic. And they we didn't know the size. They ended up being really big. So we had two, <laughs> two big Bernadoodles. Yeah. I understand that was a thing. I mean, there was a lot of pet adoptions during yeah. the, the pandemic. And I guess it's not hard to figure out why that is, but mm -hmm. my daughter adopted a dog as well. And she was saying she had to wait. She had to wait almost, uh, I think almost two months before she could get a dog because they were, they, they were all adopted. It was adopted, whether it's the kennels, whether it's the alt centers, it was tough. I mean, the biggest, biggest, one of the biggest uh, industries that had a great time was the, the dog industry. As a matter of fact, we're still seeing components of it because try to get your dog groomed now. <laughs> it's almost impossible to try to get your dog groomed. So yeah, we're seeing remnants of it. We hope everybody continues to keep the dogs though. Do not return them, right? Because yeah. that, that was the concern that people were just doing it for the pandemic if you weren't a dog lover. Yeah, it's it's been interesting. We're going to get into some of those questions, but I want you to tell us about Penn State Health a little bit. Give us a little background. Uh, so you're new there. You yeah yeah. The last time we talked, you were with uh, Kaleida Health. It was a Kaleida and Great Lakes Health, in West New York. Yep. And I, I came over to Penn State, and I'm at Penn State in College of Medicine as well. Penn State Health and the Penn State College of Medicine, and I came here at the end of 2019, which my career with a good portion of the career here at Penn State was pandemic, right? A few a few weeks in, then we started to see a pandemic and really had to pivot relatively quickly. So you can imagine just like any other CIO who started last year, it was a very interesting time to start a new organization. Transformation, I can't even tell you. Pivoting, I can't even tell you how many times we had to pivot and, and transform. Not the traditional onboarding of a new CIO when you when you come in here, you, you take care of the things that you really need to take care of. I'm actually now starting to do many of, much of those elements uh, a year and a half later because we just did not have the opportunity. We were heads down in, in really remediating to getting the entire workforce to work from home. I wouldn't say the entire, obviously we have care providers, but a good portion of our workforce, we, we got them to be at home and, and then moving into the whole vaccination component. So very interesting dynamics up till recently vaccines and now as you globally going down as far as utilization. So we're now getting back to normal, believe yeah. it or not. Well, as, as, as normal as it can get for a healthcare CIO, I mean- what, Whatever whatever normal that normal is, I, yeah. I, I remember when somebody asked me, how many projects are you currently working on in your health system? I was like, I think it's like 120, 125. And they're just like, yeah, which one do you give priority to? I'm like, some days it's whichever one I need to give a priority to, and other days you know, you're more strategic. It just there's a lot yeah. going on. 
I, yeah. 125, that's a light day. <laughs> so, so, so talk about talk about Penn State Health a little bit. So are, are you in uh, Harrisburg State College? So, so we have about six or seven, and we'll be eight, depending on how you look at it, different locations, whether the majority of our facilities are in central Pennsylvania, the central Pennsylvania proper. We are in my the corporate area in Hershey, the sweetest place on in the United States. It's a really great dynamic. The, the majority of our organization centers around the College of Medicine, right? The Milton Hershey Medical Center was built to support the College of Medicine. And that's, again, smack dab in Hershey, PA. We have other spokes out there, whether it's St. Joe's. We, have, we just took on another hospital from Geisinger, which is Holy Spirit, building another hospital in one of the areas on the West shore that's gonna be opening in less than 90 days from now um, called Hampton Hospital. And we have another hospital that we're building a brand new hospital on the east side of the east shore called Lancaster. So again, multiple hospitals, a physical therapy, a rehab hospital, children's hospital, adult hospital, we're a collection of different facilities as we continue to grow in the region. Yeah, Hershey's an interesting, place. I, I watched mm-hmm. the documentary on Milton Hershey and that whole city was meant to be sort of a planned community that was a, built around his staff and his employees and yeah. providing yeah. them the best health care, best education, yeah. best yeah. Uh, environment. If, if he, yeah. If he's not one, he's going to be a saint. That guy, the man is an absolute amazing. If you, you heard that, you saw the story about the, the man, absolutely amazing what he's been able to do and that, that culture that he's established in that community resonates throughout our health system. And, and that's why it's so important on all the things that we're doing and how we're, we're looking to just really look out for the I'm sorry, I digress once again, but I, I played golf once in Hershey and the whole oh, time yeah. I smelled chocolate. And, <laughs> and I have to apologize because I, I did work, my internship was at M&M Mars in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And it was <laughs> funny, every morning you drove into town in Hackettstown and all you could smell was chocolate as far as you, I mean, I, is it hard to lose weight in, in, in Hershey with the smell of chocolate? Yeah, you, you smell it and it's just, it's just what it is. You get, you get used to, well, I don't know if you could ever get used to it, but it, at least you crack a smile when you, you smell the chocolate. <laughs> so what's the role that the CIO entail? We've seen the CIO go in a lot of different directions, digital, CDO, CIO, that kind of stuff. What, is, what does it entail at, at Penn State Health and the College of Medicine? Yeah, so the, the CIO here, and again, the dog's barking really loud, I'm sorry, but the CIO here, you know, what we're, we're a traditional method, but when you add as a CIO for the college, there's a different element because it's not just your traditional healthcare technology, but it's, it's around research, it's health sciences, it's a university, and, and there's a, a different dynamic on how we, we manage that way, right? So... We, we, I do see the CIO role continuing to evolve in that digital manner as we do the traditional healthcare CIO things. But as we move, and I think the COVID you know, process expedited the initiative of being more digital. So in essence, our customers now expect to use technology. They used it, many of them used it to do vaccines and other things that they've been able to do. People are remote now. So I see this as a a, a more of a natural progression of the CIO helping and transition into that digital officer to allow for a better connectivity to our customers where they are. And, And I think that's a demand that we're seeing from the communities that we're serving. The College of Medicine and the Academic Medical Center's a significant data load to lift because there's all that research going on. There's also grants and that kind of stuff going on. There's just so many things that maybe aren't completely different, but they're bigger in scope and scale. And Mm -hmm. what I've heard from other academic medical centers is you have a pretty tech savvy group of people that have gotten grant money and are very, they have a lot of ingenuity. They tend to do things on their own and figure things out and put together these things. And then as the CIO, it's sort of like, okay, put the security wrapper around this, put, yeah, the, yeah. put the, all the things you need to, <laughs> to put around it. Yeah, you just described the AMC too. It's a very accurate point. We are 
traditional, we're our one facility, right? So research is inherently where, we, where we're involved in and petabytes and petabytes of data that we have to support, whether it's on a research side, or whether it's on a traditional data side. So it's not easy. They're resourceful. As you can say, our researchers are resourceful. They, they want what they want, and, and rightfully so, because they get grants. But we have to be mindful of that, and we have to understand that there's um, challenges, particularly around intellectual property, that we have to preserve, protect, and preserve. So there's that fine line of allowing and enabling our researchers to be as transformative as they can to help them with their initiatives. But there is that sensitivity that we still have to protect the information, right? And, and that's where I, I partner with uh, our CISO, Matt Snyder, amazing individual to help transform the organization and deliver what we need to while keeping ourselves protected. In today's world, it's actually a very much an issue. As you can see, the White House has issued a, a release about security. And when they're starting to talk about, hey, we may consider cyber threats no different than a terrorist threat, and we won't be able to pay ransoms. Guess what? That's a game changer, right? Those, those are things that we need to start thinking through in a much more comprehensive way than we ever did before. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to security. Actually, I'm going to march through some hot topics of the day. We'll talk yeah. security, return to work. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll talk telehealth a little bit. But before mm-hmm. I get to those things, what, what's top of mind as you look at this week or this month? What's top of mind right now for the, the CIO at, at Penn State? Yeah, so for me, we have about four major initiatives um, that are going on. We're, we're doing a new ERP solution, actually. That ERP solution is going to be going live in uh, less than 15 days. We have a new revenue cycle system that's going live in about four weeks. We have a red sketch solution and the new hospital opening in October. So between now and the end of the year, we have projects that would normally take companies, they would dedicate on that solely, singularly. We have three or four of them happening all at one time. That's for me, to be frank, it is the number one thing. Our board asked us, hey, has anything changed? Even though COVID was going on, did the landscape of our strategy change, right? And the answer was no. So they said, then you move forward. You continue to march forward. And and, and it's great to have a leadership. Um, Steve Messini, as CEO of SD, with a, a phenomenal board to help direct us in that way. But it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. We are going to have a lot of work, and that's basically top of mind for me right now. ERP, supply chain, a uh, new hospital tower. Yeah, HR. it sounds like a normal day. Yeah, HR, new HR system, new time management system, a new reg sketch system, and the new website. Because to your point, it's yeah, <laughs> all all in three months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's well, that's th- how it is, Bill. Th- thanks for carving out at least an hour for us. We really appreciate <laughs> it. Well, I, I guess I guess we'll see you we'll see you uh, next year after you're, yeah, you've yeah, done all these yeah, projects. Yeah. You know what, though, just to, to, to point, and this is good and bad of COVID and uh, this hot topic, we have, over the last year, we have established this process of doing things and working at this speed and pace, which I don't think is sustainable, right, for a long haul. I've talked to a lot of colleagues and know others feel the same way, that it's just draconian you know, as far as the amount of work. This is what happens when the industry continues to evolve. So I think this is something that not just for me, I know a lot of other colleagues across the globe are experiencing very similar elements of the work that needs to get done. And it's just going to be at a pace that we're going to have to be able to manage in the near future. Yeah, I, I've yet to talk to a healthcare CIO who said, I'm bored. There, there doesn't <laughs> seem to be anything to do. Let's march through some of the hot topics. I mean, and these are just some of the things that keep coming up as we talk to CIOs. Return to work. How are you approaching this as a health system? Return to work on site is probably the yeah, best. Yeah, 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 yeah. So our organization, we've decided that we're going to, at least for the most part, particularly around shared services, that we, we give people the option. 
right? We give them an option and we are anticipating about 50% of the workforce that are, are not bedside, not clinical at the bed will be hybrid. So we are in that process right now. Our IT division, we're going through a change. So the change is we're refabbing a building and it's going to be our IT headquarters. And so that's not going to be done. Oh, by the way, that too is going to be done at the end of the year. So, you know, we're, we're going to move into this new fabricated facility. We don't have this space now, right? We are consolidated. So for the good portion of our teams are going to remain remote and in that hybrid state until we, we move into a, a much more complete infrastructure or building. But the same thing applies to the rest of the organization. So whether it's our financial teams and, and others, those that are traditional back office that are not required to be at the bedside, we expect to see the same kind of facilitation for that, that workforce. So we do still see that about 50% will remain working in the hybrid space. So a lot of hoteling, right? And making sure we facilitate the hoteling so when they come, they have ability to be on site. But working through that that element of being more more flexible in, and in how we manage our teams. Any major challenges from a from a management standpoint in, in terms of, of managing these projects, managing these people, connecting with the people? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's a, a, a value the fact that over the last year and a half we've been able to manage people in different ways, right? Particularly being remote. So I I do think from our point of view, if we're gonna have people on site, we need to have our managers figuring it out, right? So our goals are you're there. If there's gonna um, be people on site, you have to have managers that have FaceTime, right? So giving people the ability to help them. They they wanna be on site. They also wanna interact with their managers in, in that sense. So. The goal here is we all need to just be more creative on how we're adjusting to the hybrid model that we're, we're putting in place. And also, what about the 50% of the folks that want to be on site permanently? So 100% work at the, in the office. So there is that collection of, well, we need to match the right manager, right? If the manager wants to work from home, 100% and his, that staff member wants to be at the office 100%, then there has to be some give and take. And, and that's the, I think that's the biggest um, hurdle that we have to work through. I won't pretend that we have it down. We, we are working through that, that dynamic now. But again, I don't, this is not just an IT thing. This is across the board. And I think we're just going to have to be as creative as possible to, to meet our, our our customers and our customers being our employees, right? Because I always say we are all each other's customer. So we're going to have to meet our teams and in, in where they are so that we are recognizing their needs in order for us to be successful. We, we can talk about that for the next half hour. Let's let's keep moving though. So security, there's there's been several, let, let's just call them morning shots across the valley at Sky Lakes, St. Lawrence and others last year by the uh, Ryuk ransomware attack. But this one at Scripps, Scripps is a pretty big target that was taken offline. And what I wanted to ask you, but really with, without divulging too much about your security posture, how are you approaching this, this growing threat? It's tough. Again, we talked about the academic side, right? That's a whole other element. Segmentation, looking at different elements of, of what your redundancies are. We are just going through line by line, looking at our weaknesses, looking at our threats, typical SWOT um, analysis, and trying to figure it out. I, I will not lie to you, though we know each other long enough. It is not easy. It is not, this is more of a, an art than a science because it's like whack-a-mole, right? You, you think you have one thing covered and those bad guys are, are 10 steps ahead of you. So you don't know where they're going to come out from somewhere else. And an organization such as you know, a health system where, you know, at the biggest end of the stick of, of what the issues are, it's the human factor, right? The human side, it's very difficult to do that. We emphasize education, training, reinforcing that way. We're taking very seriously what the White House is, has issued and continue to work through some elements there and figuring, trying to figure it out as, it's, as a team. 
try to remove the lowest hanging fruit of threat associated. At the end of the day, I always say this, that look, if the federal government gets compromised and they have billions, trillions of dollars and a significant amount of staff, if they're able to get compromised because of a state-sponsored threat, we're not gonna be able to facilitate to, to stop it. So it's not the typical, it's not if, but when. Our goal is to how do we remediate, right? We need to figure out an action plan to remediate and to, to, to get back up and help mitigate the risk associated to exposure. So yeah. we can, again, try to remove the lowest hanging fruit of threat vectors to, to prevent the traditional snot-nosed uh, hacker that would want to, that's in somebody's garage that wants to, to come after us. But when it comes to the state-sponsored attacks, we just have to do as much as we can to plan for a remediation effort. Yeah, security is so hard. I, I remember the after the after I took over as CIO for a health system, we did a, an assessment and we had 10 different areas. And I just looked at it and I thought, my gosh, it's going to take us a decade to fill in all these gaps because they only have to find one entry point one. Into, into the network and you have to protect you have to protect all of them. Now, obviously we changed, we changed how we think about security. It's not about just keeping them out. It's also about identifying the anomalous traffic within the network and all those things and, yeah. and shutting that down and, uh, and segmenting the network and, and all that stuff. It's the work that keeps changing because yeah. it, in the fall it was Ryuk and now it's another version and we're starting to see really sophisticated phishing attacks that people are actually using names and information that they have harvested from social media and other things so that the emails aren't as clear as salary list PDF, click on this. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot more like, hey, Cletus, how you doing? Glad to see you're back from vacation because I got information from Facebook. And, and then the links are embedded in that and away they go. But that's that's where they get so much more sophisticated and the emails start to look a lot like the other emails you're receiving from your colleagues. It's yeah. Kind of, kind of scary. Yeah, the key is question everything, right? I think that's the methodology that you have to have. And if it means slowing down and and with your response, I have to tell you, because we were fishing, people like myself and, and CEOs and other C titles, they're a high target threat right and to go after so we have to just make sure that we're being very diligent on what we are um, selecting and what we're responding to it's not easy because it's it, it, to your point there's always a new vector there's always a new a new approach on everything's a zero day when it comes to their, their new methodology of how they're coming after us so I assume telehealth was big during the pandemic yep. for you as it was yep. with every other health system. What's, mm -hmm. what's next for telehealth at Penn State? Well, we, we continue to transform with telehealth, Bill. We are looking, look, it wasn't perfect. We, we used Amwell as a third party. We've had that for years. Um, like any other health system, what they were, we were able to do is roll it out and, and make it accessible as many of our practices and services shut down. What we realized though is it wasn't, it was good, not perfect, but we had opportunities to improve. And we're in the process now of integrating that technology into the EMR. So we are at Amwell Shop and work with Cerner to make sure it's integrated within the workflow so that our, our clinicians don't have to come out of their system, go into another system document, take it back into another system, making it much more simple for clinical throughput so that in essence, it has the best experience. We do, we did understand that there was a significant amount of challenges with the customers on the other end of how they use it. Browsers, everything is not equal. You can't guarantee that everybody's going to use the same method to connect right on the um, consumer side of the shop. So the tools that we're, we're talking about using, it's, it's leveraging in ways that we can actually just be more uh, thoughtful and practical 
where the technology can accommodate all variations of, of customers on the back end, on their front end, or which is on our back end. So it's just using it in different ways to have a better outcome. But integration is key. That's going to be our, that's actually our number one follow up from what we learned uh, last year. Yeah. So those are the two things that slowed down the most is not having it well integrated internally. And then mm -hmm. just the digital divide that exists outside yeah. of uh, the four walls of the health system. I mean, you have different populations and, and people may think you're in Hershey and other rural places, but you get far enough out and there's a, there's a reason most telehealth visits during the pandemic were actually tele visits. They were telephone visits because there still is a broadband and digital divide that exists. There is, there's a huge disconnect there and we're looking in many different ways to partner with broadband carriers to, to help change that. Whether it's the, the Comcast of the world, which is in our region, Pennsylvania, or the cellular providers to look at connections from that perspective. So we're really looking at how do you help with that digital divide? And, and that's, a, that's a true problem. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, is digital health gonna accelerate or you think it'll stay at the same pace or you think it's gonna slow down coming out of the pandemic? I, th I think it's, it's going to accelerate times 10. I think we're at the cusp of, of, of greatness. We talk about going back to cyber for a second. As the continued evolution of cyber and using artificial intelligence, I do believe that we're going to have to have um, AI fight AI, right? When it comes to those who are attacking us, we're going to need it as quantum computing becomes a thing as we get down towards the zero nanometer, we're down to two now, right? Uh, the uh, two nanometers now going down from the chip size to zero. And I think that we're so close to that side that tipping the scale is going to tip so much that we're, we're going to take advantage of that. And I, I say to people, the future is not 10 years from now, the future is now. We're seeing elements of that happen inherently every day. These are tipping points that are happening all around us. So I think the evolution, the digital transformation is imperative to complement that. You bring up that AI fighting AI. And when we were trying to identify anomalies on the network back in 2013, 2014, we, we had to set up actual rules. Look for this. If you see this, then this. Mm -hmm. And what we have now is tools that are going out there watching the traffic across the network, using machine learning and saying, okay, this is what normal looks like. And then at some point when it changes, it's generating alerts. And that's without me sitting there and going, okay, I'm looking for this, 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 yeah. and this. The machine can identify new threats almost as they're happening. Yeah, because of anomalies, right? And, and that's, that's what anomaly-based detection is, is something that we're going to have to always focus on and using the machine to continue to to learn in that manner. So I completely agree with you. It's a game changer, but there's technology that's doing it today. And can you imagine that same principle gravitating towards healthcare, right? And being able to say, where's the anomaly? I, I had a, there was a personal situation where somebody I knew has a implant inserted and it's a relatively new implant for ECG kind of anomalies. And what I found that was interesting by this, it's a traditional, it's not your traditional halter system, but it's something that goes under the skin and it stays there for three years, Bill, three years. Now think about this for a second. That's three years of continuous tracking of your, your health to in, help identify strokes. That data, right? What do you do with that data? That data is so transformational that it will help when you add machine learning on top of it, it's going to be able to abstract information and, and, and health patterns that we can't even start to believe in. Three years, and we wouldn't have even thought about that right now, that it's three years, it has a cellular chip in it, and it's able to push things out where it doesn't matter where you are. You can be anywhere and that instance can actually be uploaded to the cloud. I mean, we're really talking about game-changing information and technology that's going to help us promote care once you start to add these, these algorithms on top of it to help figure out what's happening to the body 
we're, we're going to know that people are going to have an MI or something before they even know it. And that's, that's really transformational. Yeah, that is transformational and exciting. We could obviously talk about where that, where that takes us from a clinical standpoint. Mm-hmm. And we could talk about where that takes us from a, a privacy standpoint. It's interesting because when I think about privacy in that case, I think, you know what, the, the benefits far outweigh the risks to my personal privacy. Yeah. I'm more than happy to share that with an academic medical center, with others, with a even with a tech company that has the algorithms to identify those things early. Because I mean, yeah. the alternative is, okay, I might have my privacy hack or I might die. Right. So I, I would like to know those anomalies exist. And we've always said this, we have more we have more meters on our cars than we have on our personal body. So I would transfer some of my privacy rights in order to get that kind of feedback, I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think there's a component where we're going to have to decide, hey, do you want privacy all the time or do you want to live? And I think there's a fine line, but those who are in a position, particularly when you're dealing with your loved ones, know we want our loved ones to live, right? And we we're willing to do what we need to do to ensure that data is shared so that we can have the best outcome possible. So what, what's the hardest position right now to fill in IT at Penn State Health? Business intelligence, machine learning folks, CRM folks, I've noticed I'm no, no, mentioning a few, but our BI, all around data. The people around data, a security, it's all, we're all competing as industries, regardless of the vertical, we're all competing for the same skill sets. And, and now that a good portion of people are working from home and organizations are allowing it, guess what? We're not competing with people throughout the non-traditional state lines, right? So we have the ability to lose people that goes to Silicon Valley because they don't have to relocate and they can get paid a lot more money than we are. So all of these positions, these data-centric, data-rich positions, are extremely complicated and extremely difficult to fill in a, in a timely manner because of the competition is, across verticals. Is there a benefit of being at Penn State to tap into the Penn State talent in any way? We have approximately 107,000 students, right? That, that, that's across the Commonwealth, a pretty big organization. And we try, right? We have the ability to have our, our students, we have internship programs, we have other types of faculty-based models. But even with that said, and you have so many talented folks, they're looking at other organizations as well. They're looking at your Googles and Apples of the world. So if you're trying to get your top talent, can you compete with Apple? And the reality is, you no, know, we can't. We can't compete when it comes to trying to uh, attract that talent. But you do have the ability to say, if you want to be local, if you want to work for a cause, something that you know is going to help people's lives, right? You can get paid very well, but you, you also have a, almost a mission to return. And that mission is in helping save lives. And that's one something that we are absolutely doing. We saw that in the, the COVID activity, right? We did something that truly helped save lives. I don't think too many other organizations or verticals can claim. Having uh, visited Hershey Park and lived not far from there and uh, having been recruited for a job in Silicon Valley, I just, and anyone who's thinking about going to Silicon Valley needs to take into account the fact that you're going to live in a shack. (laughs) This was actually later on in my career and I was going to have a a CIO position up there in Silicon Valley and, and I still couldn't afford a home there. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable how expensive it was. So I I, I still don't know how people can, I I just, you you have to, you know, making millions and millions of dollars in order to just sustain something like that. It's, it's not realistic. Yeah. And and, and you should just show them pictures of the houses in Hershey and say, this is what you can get here. This (laughs) is where you're going to live over over here. And, uh, and you should be able to just get some chocolate. What, what do you think the lasting impact of the pandemic will be on health IT? Oh, well, this is a really good question. As far as lasting impact, I think that 
there is some, and this is not just IT, but just in general, there's a huge psychological scar, right? To what we've experienced. People, it's, it was traumatic what happened with COVID and that trauma, we're going to have to address it as a society and help in IT. It's, you know, because we were working, talk about that pace, that, that constant pace, I think we're going to have to understand, Bill, how do we navigate and, and produce the results, but not on the heels of breaking our team's backs. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge. We're seeing it with schools. We're seeing it with the psychological impact to, to industries as a whole has been really bad. And the frustrations that we're seeing on a daily basis, the increased amount of gun violence, the increased amount of violence on the planes. I think there's a correlation between what we've experienced over the last year being sheltered in place and, and we're lashing out. And I, I'm concerned that our industry, we, we're not being mindful enough of the psychological impact that all of this has had on, on folks. And that burden as well, that the health IT technology is supposed to help. And in some cases it's not. So I think that I don't have a good answer as far as how do you remediate it? But I do believe that these kind of soft, which are usually traditionally you know, quantified as soft items are actually not soft at all. They're really going to be impactful to how we navigate in the, in the near future. Uh, there, there's so much wisdom in that answer, just in terms of the, the psychological impact of this. I don't think we're going to know it for another decade. We talked earlier about getting a dog and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. People need to interact. They need to interact. They need to be a part of a community, be loved, be cared for, be uh, a part of a mission, a part of something bigger than themselves. And when you essentially lock them in their house, it's it, it, it regardless of what your thoughts are on the lockdown and its effectiveness and all that other stuff, it has an impact on people's psychology mm -hmm. in terms of coming back out, in terms of interacting with people. I remember the first time I went to a grocery store after we found out about the pandemic, and I, I was very aware of the fact that I walked through that Costco very differently. I was very aware of how far apart I was from someone. I was very aware of who was not following the rules and that kind of, and just I didn't like, I didn't like who I was becoming in my mind. Yeah. And we all had those similar battles. And what do you do exactly. with your, your family members and your, uh, how do you protect your kids and how do you protect your parents? And we had decisions to make that were weightier than any decisions we've had to make before. And I think that I agree with you. There's a long-term psychological impact to that, that we, we're not going to know for quite some time. I, I always go back to 9-11 and one person tried to, or a couple of people put a improvised bomb in their shoe. And ever since we have to remove our shoe when we're boarding a plane, years later, decades later, we're going on 20 years of 9-11. We, we still are managing it differently. And that's, it was a catastrophe. Don't get me wrong. But we have, we're coming up to 600,000 people dying in this country, opposed to several thousand. And I think that recourse is going to just it's going to continue to find its way. Can you imagine the first time we're back together and we're in the flu season side and people start to cough in a, a meeting setting? We don't have masks. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, right? And I think that we need to be mindful of our teams. I would encourage people. I mentioned that we have a lot of things going on, but you know what? Nothing's more important than your family. Nothing's more important than taking time off. Take the time. We have a lot going on, but I emphasize, take time off. Public mental health is absolutely critical. And we have to emphasize to our team members to take time off of work, get a break, check out. The ironic part about this bill, the type of person I was is, no, you don't check out, right? Because in IT, everything's always happening. But right. now, check out, take off, go silent. I'm saying those words now that 
few years ago have matured where I should say adjusted that we can't live like that anymore. It's the, the game has changed. Yeah, it is. And I, I, I have to confess, I was one of those bosses. I, I used to get into the office around 530 only because you know, as a CIO, you had to get your work done yeah. and I could get my work done between 530 and 830. Then you had mm-hmm. to interact with your managers and help them to get their work done. Yep. And then you just had the deluge of meetings that you had mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. go mm-hmm. to. And so I, that 5.30 to 8.30 time for me was when I actually got my work done or it was after hours. And it was, it was really demanding. But I, again, I also found myself psychologically fighting the fact of saying, hey, it's 6.30, it's 7.30 and no one's in the office yet. Am I the only one who cares? I'd, looking I'd, at the parking lot, right? Yeah, looking, looking at, at the, the parking, parking lot. lot. My office overlooked the parking lot. So I could yeah. see it. And I was like, why aren't these people, why don't they care? Why aren't they in here? And you just have to fight that because they do care. We work to live, not live to work. And and I think that's the biggest, if we haven't learned anything over the last year and a half, that's it. We have, we have to change our mindset. And what's interesting, other countries have gotten this long before ours, right? Whether it's the siestas or this, and I'm not implying we take days off, but I, I guess this now at Penn State Health. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think they had some idea, right? They understood that it's not about living to work, right? And it's not good. And and I think from a healthcare IT industry, if we as CIOs and, and other executives, if we continue to go down that road, we are going to perpetuate a, a negative industry or a negative culture that in a decade from now, we're going to look back and say, holy cow, we did this. We did something really wrong. And I think this is the time to do it. I think this is the time. We start now and saying we have to change. We, we, but we can do things. We can do it. I mock siestas, but my, one of my habits now, I, I still get up at 5.30. I don't know why. I guess because I'm getting older. It's conditioned. Yeah. Yeah. But the one of the things I do now is I, I take a half hour nap right around uh, 12, uh, from 1230 to one, no one expects me to be around anyway. It's great. It's almost like having two days because you, you wake up and you're, yeah. you're ready to go again. So I, yeah. I don't but, know if we can incorporate that into the normal work day. If I could just chime in just two seconds on that one. So sure. I, like you're, you're taking a nap. I, I think I, I do, I did this for a while and I, I, you get away from it and particularly in home is take your meetings outside, take a walk, walk and talk and, and enjoy the times, right? You can meet with your teams by taking a nice stroll if the day is really nice out there. One of the things I'm also promoting is since we're mobile, then you can be anywhere, right? You, you don't have to be in your house. I, I try to encourage my team, go to a coffee house and make a secure connection. Go, go, go to the park, you know, do whatever it is take it in. I, I went, I was in a, a meeting with the team the other day and I, I'm going to create a small competition. Hey, what, what, what scenery can we do best? So I drove to Central Park and I did some of my meeting from Central Park, right? From Pennsylvania to Central Park. So you could do these kind of little things and, and then make a game out of it. Have some fun at it. Let's get back to having fun. I, I think we, we got lost there. And I, I just want to make sure I emphasize that as that's a way you, you this is small little things you can do to help your teams through this really tough time. Yeah. I'm, I'm careful where I use the word normal, but, but getting back to what life looked like prior to the pandemic, what's going to be the first conference that you attended in person, or maybe you already attended one. I wasn't going to go, but I'm going to attend PIMS and, and then I'm going to chime. So I'm doing both. So those are going to be my two main organizations. That's- there are different times now as they, they've kind of separated. What about you? I'm going to Hims. I have some commitments at Hims, so I'm going to go mm-hmm. there. And I'm also going to Chime in San Diego. So I'm looking forward, mm-hmm. to, looking forward to catching up and seeing you at both of those. Same here, same here. I wasn't sure whether CIs were going to go, but more and more I'm talking to people, they're going to stop in. And, 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 and almost everyone I've talked to is going to Chime in San Diego. Mm-hmm. But more and more I'm hearing... People are going to stop in at, at him. It is always a pleasure to uh, you, catch Bill. up with you. I guess I will see you at those two conferences. But yeah. other than that, it sounds like you're going to be busy for the next couple of months. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And and that's probably 
why I'm 100% not committed because it all depends on how things are going, right? So everything that I have happening, hey, to be honest with you, if I if something's not passing the smell test, I won't be there, right? So it's it's just the reality of the world. Yeah, that's the life of the CIO. Thanks yeah. again. Appreciate Thank your time. You, sir. Take care, man. Have a good one. What a great discussion. If you know of someone that might benefit from our channel, from these kinds of discussions, please forward them a note. Perhaps your team, your staff. I know if I were a CIO today, I would have every one of my team members listening to this show. It's it's conference level value every week. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or they can go wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, which is what I use, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, we're out there. They can find us. Go ahead, subscribe today, send a note to someone and have them subscribe as well. We want to thank our channel sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. Those are VMware, Hillrom, Starbridge Advisors, Aruba, and McAfee. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.